Welcome everyone uh, for Charlotte's presentation. Uh, I don't know if everyone knows, but Charlotte's doing some very cool work on uh, on probing on um, trying to do like some causal analysis of how how retrained language models use information and how they encode this. Uh, so that's what the presentation will be about. Um, but but yeah. Um, Thanks, Charlie. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so let me share my screen. Okay, do you see it? Cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so thanks for having me. Um, so I'm a second year PhD student at Bar Ilan University. Um, and I will talk about a line of work which uh, studies the ability to identify subspaces within the representation space of neural models and manipulate them or remove them or neutralize them in order to influence the behavior of neural models. So let's start. And uh, please feel free to uh, ask questions and interject at any uh, moment. Okay, so um, this is the agenda. So I, I will first uh, describe a, a method which we have proposed in ACL 2020, which is called uh, Iterative Analysis Projection, or INLP. This is a method to remove uh, specific information from neural representations. I will uh, focus on the use of this method as a tool to mitigate bias, for example, gender bias. I will also briefly mention some other uh, use cases of this, for example, to generate counterfactual representations. And in the second part of the talk, I will uh, talk about some ongoing work which um, tries to study the optimality of the above discussed method and uh, improve over it. Okay, so let's start. Um, so we know that neural models are very good at learning uh, rich representations of text. And these representations are increasingly being used in real world applications. So if we look on one example for such an application, we may have the uh, CV of some person as an input, and we feed it to some very smart uh, neural model, and then we get some prediction. For example, whether or not we should hire this person to, to the job. Now, this is all uh, good and it tends to work. So like neural models are good at um, distilling the important features from the input text. But the representation they uh, use in this uh, kind of classification tasks are kind of a black box. So we don't want, we don't know what is actually encoded in them, and they are kind of emerging in an unsupervised manner from the uh, training procedure. So these representations might encode uh, relevant information. So in this task, this may be like information about the education of the of the candidate, but it may also encode information we. We, we will not want to be uh, included in the representation, for example, some information about the gender of the candidate. So we would not want um, the decision to rely on gender. Um, so more generally, we often want the ability to control the content of neural representations. So to decide which information is present there, there and which information is not present there. Um, this requires the ability to identify the components in the representation which encode or are responsible for the encoding of specific concepts such as gender or race or any other information we would want to neutralize from the representation. Um, so uh, in AI level, we may have this, uh, like, uh, this uh, rectangle which represents the uh, representation we get some, from some neural model, for, for example, for the biography of some person, and it may encode so different kinds of information. So we may have information about the education of the person, their uh, previous experiments, etc. But it, all, it also may, it may also include information about the gender. And we want to be able to distill, to remove this kind of information. So we want to uh, derive from the original representation another representation, which is very similar to the original one, but it doesn't include anymore the sensitive information. Okay, so I'll start with describing the INLP or iterative analysis projection, which is uh, a method we propose to do just this. So kind of uh, dissect a, new, a given a set of representations and remove a specific kind of information from them. Um, so our approach is uh, 
data driven and is based on very similar very simple ideas in linear algebra um, and uh, the linearity of this method also allows us to provide some formal guarantees which is something uh, pretty uh, difficult for more uh, like uh, uh, complex uh, neural methods and we work on pre-trained representations. So we may have like the representation that any uh, off-the-shelf language model gives us, so it can be built or anything like this. And we perform some intervention in these representations and remove the information we do not want to, uh, to be included there. Um, and we will we'll, uh, see that this kind of method can also be applied to deep learning systems. So for example, deep, deep classifiers that rely on language models. Um, so, any questions so far on the general uh, objective? Okay. Uh, so, if there are no questions, I will start with the method itself. So, say that this, is, this uh, H is the vector that Bert uh, gives us for some uh, um, text. So, let's uh, stick with the example of uh, a biography of a person, and we want to decide whether or not this person fits for a given job. Um, we can train a gender classifier of this representation, a linear gender classifier. So this is kind of a probe which tries to predict the gender of the person from the representation of their biography. And let's say that in this case, the gender classifier succeeds. So let's say that this is a biography of a female and the classifier correctly predicted it. If the classifier was able to predict the gender of the person from the representation of their biography, it means that it identified some uh, latent features within the representation that are indicative of the property of gender in this case. So here we mark them in orange. Okay. And our idea is that if we are able to identify these like, features which are indicative of gender, we can just remove them in order to prevent the ability to predict gender from the representation. So we start with the original representation. And then we get this new representation, which is very similar to the original one. It, it just doesn't contain anymore the features which were useful for gender prediction. Okay, so this uh, slide is important because it, it, it actually describes the, like, the essence of the method. So we train classifiers, linear classifiers, to predict the sensitive information we want to remove. And by some linear algebra, which I will describe in a moment, we remove the features which were identified as this, as being uh, correlated or predictive of the protected attributes. Um, any questions on this? Is it clear? Uh, uh, quick question. Hi. Yeah. Um, Hi. Uh, is there any uh, control over uh, removing information about uh, gender? I mean, is it possible that in addition to removing gender features, we remove another impo uh, information? Yeah, that's a very good question. So we do not explicitly control for that. Uh, we can test for that, like uh, after we perform the intervention and see empirically whether we also remove other kinds of information, but we do not like, uh, we do not uh, explicitly encourage the, the, this method to only remove the, the relevant information. Oh, I see, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, so let's continue. Um, so the question remains is the question that remains is how to remove this feature. So how do we know which features are responsible to the to the encoding of the protected attributes and how to remove them? Um, so mathematically, our goal is to learn some projection matrix P which removes these features. So we want to find a matrix P such that after we multiply the input by P, any linear classifier W that tries to predict the gender information will, also, will always predict the, like, uh, the zero vector. So this uh, gender classifier W will, will, become, will become completely um, uh, unable to predict the sensitive information. Now, how do we achieve this? So let's uh, see a, a geometric uh, example which uh, illustrates how this method actually works. So this is, example is naturally in, in two dimensions, but the algebra uh, generalizes naturally to higher dimensions. 
So let's say that we have two classes, so the uh, circle class and the triangle class. And this uh, intuitively corresponds to the um, two possible values of the sensitive information we want to remove. So this can be males versus females or anything like this. And we assume that this, there, is a linear, uh, there is a linear separator that uh, separates these two classes. So we can fit some uh, line in two dimensions or in higher dimensions, we can fit some uh, uh, subspace. So some uh, linear separator which separates between the two classes, the representations that belong to the two classes. Now let's, let's and this uh, subspace is parameterized by some vector w, okay? So this vector w, it, it uh, defines the separating plane. And we can also define the um, orthogonal subspace, which, which, which is called the null space of w, which is um, the, by definition, is the set of all vectors x, such that w maps x to the zero vector. So this is the definition here on the left. So the null space is all the representations x, such that x is mapped directly to the zero vector by w. And intuitively, this means that like, the null space is orthogonal to W, right? So if two vectors are orthogonal, if you uh, take the third product of them, you get zero. Now, let's say that we have some input, a specific input X, okay? So this can be the biography of any specific uh, person, uh, which we do not want uh, to encode the, uh, their gender. We can decompose uh, the, this vector X into two components. The first one is the projection on the gender subspace on W. So this is the component in the vector X, which encodes the gender information or more generally the sensitive information. It, it encodes that this point uh, is present in this side of the separating plane. And we also have the orthogonal uh, components. And this is the uh, component which lies on the separating plane, okay? So we have the gender subspace, uh, the, sorry, the gender component and the orthogonal component. Now, if our goal is to neutralize or remove the gender information, we can take the original representation and project it onto the separating plane. Okay, so we moved from the original representation to a representation that lies exactly on the separating plane. And once the representation is projected onto the separating plane or mathematically on the null space, we can no longer predict the gender. Okay, so this original gender classifier beca becomes useless because it is exactly orthogonal to the representation after the projection. Now, here in two dimensions, this seems like a very drastic operation, okay? So we removed one of the two uh, components, but in a high dimensional space, where, for example, we have uh, belt representations, which have hundreds of dimensions, we only remove a single dimension. So this is very like limited intervention, which only removes the information which is relevant for this distinction between uh, the two values of the protected attribute. Um, any question on uh, this description? Okay. Um, so this is the essence of uh, the operation that uh, tries to neutralize the information. We take the original representation. We have this uh, separate in plane, which we can find just by training a linear classifier. So the linear classifier gives us by definition the separate in plane. And once we have it, we can project uh, the original representation on the separate in plane. And we get a representation which is very similar, but no longer, uh, is no longer uh, uh, classified by gender. Okay. Um, um, now, Carlos, the term. Yeah. Uh, sorry, there's a, a question here in the chat. Uh, Connor is asking yeah. if W are the weights in your linear classifier for gender. Exactly. W defines the separating plane, the, the gender uh, like uh, separating plane, and it is actually the weights of the vector of the classifier. Um, I have a, a question that we um, actually talked about before, um, but that uh, so when you're training W in in here, it looks like you're only training on. Um, what is it like a linear transformation instead of an affine? You don't have a bias vector. Um, right. Did, uh, we talked about like the how the bias vector might influence how how you create these projections, right? Uh, do, mm -hmm. 
do you have an opinion of how how that might influence or do you think it shouldn't or or yeah so it should right because like uh, we can in, in this example it shouldn't because the there is a, a separating plane which passes through the origin and separates the, the two classes uh, completely but we can think of a case where we like uh, shift all uh, all the points uh, upwards and then we will not have a single like uh, a separating plane which passes through the origin and separates the two classes but we can transform the representation uh, before we apply this intervention such that they do uh, they are centered essentially and or are, are uh, like the, the the distribution of the points uh, like is centered around the origin and then we can apply this uh, uh, process and learn a subset that uh, passes through the origin in the transformed space after like shifting the points. That the so question. you shift the points, you apply this transformation that passes through the and origin then we shift and then back. you shift it back. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, okay. I have a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, why we assume uh, gender information is linearly encoded in the representation? Uh, how do you think if uh, the geometry of this information is uh, different from linear one? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we don't assume like um, we we propose a method which uh, is useful when the information is linearly present. And we also protect only against linear predictors. So we protect against classifiers which uh, try to predict the information linearly. You are uh, right that we do not have we do not have any guarantees against like nonlinear classifiers. And there were, I will mention it uh, in in the uh, in uh, in a few uh, slides. But we also uh, so so there are two uh, things I want to mention here. First, empirically, many interesting and human interpretable concepts are present linearly in the representation. So for example, for gender, if you take a belt and you uh, use some like commonly used uh, gender uh, bias uh, data sets, you get uh, around 100% of uh, linear classification accuracy by gender. So this is just like an empirical observation. And this is not this is not true only for gender, it's true for many other uh, like properties and all the literature on probing uh, like mostly relies on this, right? Because most of the probes that people uh, train for to predict, for example, a syntactic function or things like this from the representations are, are, are usually linear. Um, and secondly, um, this is actually, this is a good point. So this is the limitation of, of this method. So we do not, we do not remove all the, a gender association, we only remove the parts which are encoded linearly. Um, but the user in the, yeah, sure. I, I just want to say that the use of uh, like linear methods and the choice to protect against linear adversaries also has some advantages. So we get a method which is more interpretable and as easy to work uh, with because like uh, linear algebra is easier than non-linear algebra. You had, you had another question? Does that answer the question? Yes, yes, sure. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Um, so what I discussed so far is protecting against this, this uh, single linear classifier. So we train the linear classifier to predict gender and we perform some operation which ensures that this specific linear classifier can no longer predict the gender. Um, but what we observed empirically is that after we uh, do this operation, so we start from the original age and then we get this like the biased age by uh, multiplying by this uh, projection matrix, we can still train another classifier W2 on the so-called the biased representation and the classifier often succeeds. So we get uh, significantly above majority accuracy. So there is some like remaining information even after removing this single dimension. Uh, so this uh, new classifier identifies other features in the representations which are uh, indicative of gender. Okay, so these are the new orange features. Um, and intuitively this happens because uh, in highly uh, high dimensional space, there are often different orthogonal or multiple orthogonal uh, uh, 
separators, linear separators, but separates the representation space according to some properties such as gender. So there is more than, there seems to be more than a single separating plane. So we just repeat the process. We can also calculate the null space of this, uh, like uh, the null space of the second class file and find the projection matrix, which neutralizes the features that this classifier uses. Okay, so we started with the original representation. We got the first projection matrix, which neutralized the features that this first classifier uses. And then we have this a new projection matrix, P2, which uses the features that the second classifier uses. Okay, so we have kind of an iterative process. And then we uh, get a, a new representation which do not contain any of the features that two of the, the two classifiers have used. Okay, so, and we can repeat this process until we get to a point where no additional linear classifier can predict the projected attribute with an above majority accuracy. Okay, so we do this iterative process until we get to a point where we can no longer classify gender linearly. So we remove all the features that are responsible for the encoding of the gender information. Um, okay, so the algorithm is quite simple. We iteratively train a classifier to predict the sensitive information from the representation. We project the data on its null space. So this is just like the neutralization of the features that the classifier uh, used. And we kind of accumulate this projection to uh, it to uh, exhaustively remove all the different features which are responsible for this information. Okay, so this is the method. Um, so far, I've described its uh, um, uh, application for the goal of removing the information or mitigating the bias in this case. I will briefly mention that we can also look on a complementary goal. So here we wanted to remove information, but in practice, we, what we get from this method is a set of uh, linear classifiers where if, it, if the information we try to predict, for example, is, is binary, for example, a binary gender, each classifier is just like a vector or some direction within the representation space of the model. And this direction is kind of uh, related to the concept of interest, so here for gender. So if we look on the subset of all these classic, all these directions, all these vectors, W1, W2, so the vector of the first gender classifier, the vector of the second one, etc., we get some subspace within the representation space of the model, which is responsible for the encoding of the information. So this is kind of a, an empirical gender subspace within a their representation space. So if we want to get a kind of a gender neutral a, a representations, we can just like neutralize the subspace. And this is what the algorithm uh, is doing. But we may also focus on the subspace itself. So for example, if we want to study how gender information is encoded in BERT, so which features, uh, which aspects of gender which are uh, present in uh, written text are encoded by BERT, for example, we can focus on this gender subspace. So we get a very like low dimensional subspace uh, when compared to the original dimensionality of BERT which linearly encode the information. And we had some uh, works which um, uh, studied this uh, use case, uh, this complementary use case. I will not uh, linger on it too much because of uh, time constraints. Okay, so I think this is a good point to um, verify that everyone feels comfortable with the high-level description of the method. Um, so any question on that? Yeah, so the the end result here are you actually getting vectors that are exactly one dimension smaller than the original each time you do this yes yeah so this is a little like a delicate point so the dimensionality stays the same okay so if we started with 100 dimensional vectors we are still uh, having 100 dimensional vectors but the rank of the uh, vectors is decreased so you can think of it uh, as a, uh, like, like the following example, say that we start with three dimensional uh, vectors. So each vector is some point in the three dimensional space. And after the projection, after removing the one uh, dimension, we end up with the XY plane. So the XY plane is still like present within the three dimensional space. So we still have three coordinates, but one of the coordinates is zero or is neutralized. 
is it the case that one of the values is always going to be zero or is it going to be the case that somewhere within that three-dimensional space there exists a two-dimensional plane where everything of interest is on the two-dimensional plane but it's not necessarily orthogonal right. to the other axes right so the latter so we do not okay. necessarily like zero out one of the coordinates but it's equivalent right because we can always like rotate the axis got it such that uh, yeah so so if you remove four dimensions from your hundred dimensional uh vector you could in principle project that onto a 96 dimensional space but you're mm -hmm. not doing that right because we want to like to be able to use these uh, representations in a similar way uh, to the way we use the original one so we want to keep the dimensionality of the original okay any other question um this methods um so for example for a language like uh portuguese the words like mathematics informatics uh um biology they will all be feminine um mm -hmm. this this method would project out uh some of that semantics right because the semantics yeah. has a spurious correlation with with gender in that case um, so you say that like a specific, uh, specific set of semantic classes are associated with specific gender, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, so this is a good point. Like, so this method works on correlations, right? So we work with classifiers, we don't do anything causal. So it will remove any feature which is uh, helpful for predicting the information we try to remove. So if the semantics happens to be uh, predictive and is encoded linearly, we may also damage it. Um, and ideally, we would want to somehow account for that, but the, the, the current method doesn't. Okay, yeah, makes sense. And this, this all assumes that you have labels for all of your training data, l labels on whatever uh, feature, it, sensitive feature you're trying to neutralize. Right, we work in a fully supervised setting. Okay, okay. Uh, so let's uh, continue. Um, I will briefly mention that uh, so far we have uh, I have described uh, how do how do we apply this method on a single vector or on a collection of vectors. But what what we do if we have a, a pre-trained model which performs like a deeper model which performs some task. For example, we have a deep classification model. So um, we have some potentially biased vector, and we apply our method INLP on this vector. So you can think of this vector as a kind of uh, um, like the glove embeddings or some like uh, word embeddings, and we we showed that we can apply our method and get some like a clean version of the vectors. Um, and after we um, get these clean, ve clean uh, vectors, uh, the linear classifiers that try to predict the, the product attributes uh, fail, right? They, cannot, they can no longer predict the product attribute. But what we do when we have a deep model, so say that uh, we have uh, dirt, so these are the different layers of dirt, and we find we find with dirt for some classification tasks, so for example, for predicting whether or not a person uh, fits for the job. And we want to mitigate uh, the bias that may exist in such a deep classifier. So the idea is that any uh, deep model can be decomposed into two parts, right? So we have the encoder, which may be like all the layers of dirt. And then we have the final layer, the final layer of dirt. And at the top, we have some linear classification layer. So this is the, like, the final, final classification layer which predicts the uh, task of interest. So for example, we predict whether or not the person fits for the job. And maybe we have some uh, like soft maps on the end. Um, so we can we call the last hidden representation of the encoder H and the final uh, main task classifier W. So the idea that we propose is to freeze the encoder and apply our intervention on the last hidden layer on H. Okay, so we... Um, we take the original H and we add this projection uh, matrix uh, on the top, which ensures that this uh, H no longer uh, linearly encode gender. 
Now we have this uh, uh, sort of debiased version of the final uh, hidden layer and we can apply it, uh, we can like uh, feed it into the final prediction layer and get the, um, the, the label for the main task, whether or not the person fits for the job. And uh, potentially we can also fine tune the, this final linear layer afterwards. And since this layer is linear, and we have run the method until we get to a point where no linear classifier can predict the protected attribute, we can be sure that this like a uh, final linear layer can no, cannot recover the bias. So it performs the original task of um, predicting whether or not the person fits for the job without being able to condition on the sensitive information. Okay, um, so I will briefly describe the results um, because I want, also, I want to uh, have enough time to also describe the, um, the another method, the ongoing work which builds on this work. So this seems to work and it uh, works significantly better than uh, previous debiasing methods. So here, for example, we see uh, the results of uh, applying this method to um, uncontextualized word vectors. So on the left, we see a uh, glove embeddings colored by gender bias. So we, um, by some heuristic, we colored each vector according to being male biased or female biased. So for example, wor words such as mathematics are male biased and other words are female biased. Okay, so initially we see a very clear linear separation in this uh, TSNE plot, okay? so. This is kind of uh, indicative that the representation space actually encodes with gender distinctions linearly. And indeed, we, we, we do not sh show it here, but we can train a linear classifier that gets almost 100% accuracy in predicting the gender association of a word vector. And re uh, remember that our method is iterative. So here we show the same representation space during the debiasing procedure, and we see that Oh, sorry, uh, the animation here is a little broken, so you, you could not see very well, but if you uh, focus enough, you can see that the representation space become, becomes much less uh, um, uh, partitioned by gender after the application of the method, okay? So we, for example, even after uh, three iterations of our method, just by removing three dimension, dimensions from the representation, we get to a point where we can no longer linearly predict gender in IR course accuracy. And we also quantified it with some measures of uh, clustering according to gender. Um, we also tried to apply the method on some deep classification tasks. So we had a data set of short biographies of uh, people uh, we work on uh, 28 uh, different professions and we had a gender an annotation for each uh, biography. So for example, we may have, have uh, this biography of uh, some person who works uh, with, uh, uh, in some uh, music related uh, job. We feed it to BERT, uh, we get the CLS representation of BERT and we apply our method to remove the gender association. And then we linearly predict the professions. Okay, so the main task is predicting the profession of the person and the uh, sensitive information is their gender. Um, so here we see some uh, measure of uh, the impact of our intervention. So let's see what we uh, have here. On the x-axis, we have, we have the percentage of uh, women who work in each profession. So for example, uh, profession, professions such as Nels are highly female biased. So like most of the biographies belong to uh, women. And we have some other uh, uh, professions which are male biased. And in the y-axis, we see some uh, measure of gender bias. So we kind of measure how, uh, to what extent the profession classifier relies on gender. And initially we see a very high correlation, okay? So there is a correlation between the percentage of women in a given profession and the uh, bias of the model. So the model is actually uh, identifying the gender associations and is using them when predicting the main task. And here we see the same plot after our intervention. So we still have some weak correlations, but generally the, the association between the gender and the uh, bias are highly uh, mitigated. Okay, um, so this is the description of uh, the first work, the iterative analysis projection. Uh, 
I think it's also, now is also a good uh, time to stop for questions. And if there are none, we can continue to uh, follow up works. Um, so I will briefly mention one. I will briefly mention one uh, uh, follow-up work which examined uh, the like uh, the the ability to use the same method to study a completely different uh, question. So so far we try to remove information from the representation, right? So we had some uh, uh, information which we do not want to be included, and we perform some intervention and we neutralize this information. We can actually do more than that. We can use this kind of method to generate, generate arbitrary counterfactual representations. So these are uh, representations which derive from the originals, but uh, are modified with respect to a specific uh, concept which we are interested in. So it can be gender, but it can also be syntactic function or semantics or any other uh, property which we are interested in. So this is uh, um, the idea in uh, a work which will appear in uh, Cornell uh, next month with uh, uh, Grusha Prasad Talins and my advisor Yaz Golder. And instead of neutralizing the information, we just modify it. So I will not uh, uh, get too much into this work. I will just like uh, geometrically uh, demonstrate the idea. Um, so we focused on a very specific linguistic uh, question, which is completely unrelated to gender bias. We wanted to understand how models encode and use information about clausal boundaries and specifically about relative clauses. Okay, so if we have sentences like this, the red, the red, uh, the words which are marked by uh, in red are outside of the relative clause, are in the main clause. And we have this uh, green word, so the, the green clause, which is a relative clause, which modifies the subject. And we wanted to understand how the model uses this information. So similarly to what we did before, we can uh, have this uh, like uh, uh, visualization where we have the representations that uh, belong to the two classes, words inside and outside of relative clause. We can find the, set, the empirical relative clause subspace just by applying our method for the task of predicting whether or not a representation is a, in a relative clause. And now given a specific world which is uh, outside of a relative clause, we can even neutralize it. So this is completely uh, uh, identical to what we did before. We completely removed the information to predict whether or not the world is in a relative clause, but we can, do, we can also do other things. So we can um, move the representation to the other side of the separating plane. Okay, so we started with a world which was in the part of the representation space which contained all the words which are outside of relative clause. And then we kind of take a mirror image with respect to the uh, separating plane, and we get a, world, a, a new representation which is quite similar to the original, but now it lies in the other part of the representation space, right? It, it, it lies near other words which are inside of relative clause. Okay, so, and once we have this counterfactual representation, we can substitute it for the original one and see how the behavior of the model changes. And this is kind of allow us to assess the causal importance of any concept. In, in this specific case, it is a relative clause. So how do models use, it? How do models use uh, the information about causal boundaries? Um, 